Hello and welcome to Daily Prayer today for December 1st, 2020. Glad that you are with me. Let's go ahead and get started. Love and faithfulness will meet. Justice and peace will embrace. Faithfulness will spring from the earth, and justice will look down from heaven. The Lord be with you, and also with you. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. Merciful God, we give thanks that through the gift of our baptism, you offer the forgiveness of sin and wash us clean from all evil. By the power of your Holy Spirit, renew our lives and make us worthy to enter into your eternal sanctuary. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Our readings for today are Joel, Joel chapter 2. Um, you might remember that Joel um, is remembering the sort of recent event of, of a locust swarm that came in and using that as a way to call the people to repentance. And also we're kind of doing this forward looking to uh, the future day of the Lord. So listen for God's word to speak to you. Blow the trumpet in Zion. Sound the alarm on my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord is coming. It is near, a day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and thick darkness, like blackness spread upon the mountains. A great and powerful army comes. Their like has never been from of old, nor will it be again after them in ages to come. Fire devours in front of them, and behind them a flame burns. Before them the land is like the Garden of Eden but after them a desolate wilderness, and nothing escapes them. They have the appearance of horses, and like war horses they charge, as with the rumbling of chariots they leap on the tops of the mountains, like the cracking of a flame of fire devouring the stubble, like a powerful army drawn up for battle. Before them peoples are in anguish, all faces grow pale, Like warriors they charge, like soldiers they scale the wall, each keeps to its own course. They do not swerve from their paths, they do not jostle one another, each keeps to its own track. They burst through the weapons and are not halted. They leap upon the city, they run upon the walls, they climb up into the houses, they enter through the windows like a thief. The earth quakes before them. The heavens tremble, the sun and the moon are darkened, and the stars withdraw their shining. The Lord utters his voice in the head of his army. How vast is his host! Numberless are those who obey his command. Truly, the day of the Lord is great, terrible indeed. Who can endure it? Yet even now, says the Lord, return to me with all your heart, with fasting, with weeping, and with mourning. Rend your hearts and not your clothing. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and relents from punishing. Who knows whether he will not turn and relent and leave a blessing behind him, a grain offering and a drink offering for the Lord your God? Blow the trumpet in Zion, sanctify a fast, call a solemn assembly, gather the people, Sanctify the congregation, assemble the aged, gather the children, even the infants at the breast. Let the bridegroom leave his room, and the bride her canopy. Between the vestibule and the altar, let the priests, the ministers of the Lord, weep. Let them say, Spare your people, O Lord, and do not make your heritage a mockery, a byword among the nations. Why should it be said among the peoples, Where is their God? Then the Lord became jealous for his land and had pity on his people. In response to his people, the Lord said, I am sending you grain, wine, and oil, and you will be satisfied. And I will no more make you a mockery among the nations. I will remove the northern army far from you and drive it into a parched and desolate land. Its front into the eastern sea and its rear into the western sea. Its stench and foul smell will rise up. Surely he has done great things. 
Do not fear, O soil. Be glad and rejoice, for the Lord has done great things. Do not fear, you animals of the field, for the pastures of the wilderness are green. The tree bears its fruit. The fig tree and vine give their full yield. O children of Zion, be glad, and rejoice in the Lord your God, for he has given the early rain for your vindication. He has poured down for you abundant rain, the early and the later rain as before. The threshing floors shall be full of grain, the vats shall overflow with wine and oil. I will repay you for the years that the swarming locust has eaten, the hopper, the destroyer, and the cutter, my great army which I sent against you. You shall eat in plenty and be satisfied. And praise the name of the Lord your God, who has dealt wondrously with you, and my people shall never again be put to shame. You shall know that I am in the midst of Israel, and that I, the Lord, am your God, and there is no other, and my people shall never again be put to shame. Then afterwards, I will pour out my Spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, your old men shall dream dreams, and your young men shall see visions. Even on the male and female slaves, in those days I will pour out my spirit. I will show portents in the heavens and on the earth, blood and fire and columns of smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood. Before the great and terrible day of the Lord comes, then everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem there shall be those who escape, as the Lord has said, and among the survivors shall be those whom the Lord calls. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. All right. So Joel, again, uses this, this image of these locusts that are attacking, and it sort of morphs, the language morphs, where it is no longer describing this swarm of locusts, but this great and terrible army coming. Um, he is shifting from this reflecting on a day of the Lord that has already come to a day of the Lord that is yet to be. And uses this again to call the people to repentance, call the people to, um, to turn from their wicked ways. Again, he doesn't mention specifically what it is, because he, and hopefully those who are hearing his words, are steeped in the prophets. He, they know that all of the things that they have done, that they should not have done, their worshiping of other gods, their lack of justice and righteousness, um, their continued just doing things that are good for themselves and not for others, all of these sorts of things, right? He says, repent from those things. Even then, even then, the Lord who is slow uh, or who is um, gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, who relents from punishing, even now God will turn from the wrath that is planned and bring about good. And that good is this overflowing of, of wine and oil and grain and all of these sorts of things. God will restore everything that was taken away during the time of these locusts. God is even more willing to, to sort of to, to bless than God is willing to punish. This is a God of abundance. This is a God who, who yes, sometimes uses punishment as ways to, to refocus us, but who gives back more and more and blesses more and more and restores to us all the things that have been lost. Not only does God give back all of those material things, but God here promises through Joel that that God's own spirit will be poured out on all flesh as this sort of extravagant overabundance, right? Not the Holy Spirit that is, you know, the word of God was, was rare in the days of, of um, Samuel. It says in 1 Samuel, right? Just the word of God being so rare that even Samuel didn't recognize the word, uh, the, the voice of God to this over just just blessing of the spirit at pentecost where the the spirit is poured out on all flesh where today 
all of us have the ability and and are even encouraged to to listen and commune with the Holy Spirit, to work with the very Spirit of the living God that that calls us, that draws us to the presence of the Lord. Joel is, is here promising this. Um, That not only will God restore our fortunes, not only will God restore our place, but God will restore and give us even more of God's presence than even we had before. Um, This is, especially in a a post-exilic Jerusalem, um, when the temple has been destroyed, where even when it is rebuilt, it's, it's just a shadow of what it used to be, where the very presence of God, according to uh, Ezekiel, has actually gone away from the temple itself. God is promising God's own abundant spirit on all of us, with all of us. This is a great thing to 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 hold on to. Um, during a time of challenge, during a time, as I said yesterday, that we, we're we dealing with all sorts of things, with coronavirus, with um, systemic poverty and racism, uh, with, with ecological disaster, with all of these sorts of things that are sort of piling up, and it feels like they're piling up even more this year than most years. Um, we can take not only the, the note that God is maybe at work in us and through us in order to repent, to, to turn from wickedness, to turn from the ways that we grieve God, where we, we are not in good relationship with God, with one another, and with creation. And also claim the promise that God will do immeasurably more than we could ask or imagine. Um, Not that God is going to give us riches, but that God is going to restore us. That God's, that, that, that relationship with God will be and continually is restored. That the Spirit of God is being poured out upon us and that we just need to grasp onto it. Seek that relationship with the living God and be in right relationship with God and one another and the world around us. That, that that promise is for us and for our children. And it will, in fact, be further fulfilled. So we await that time when it will be further fulfilled, but we also prepare ourselves for the coming of God into our world through Jesus Christ, through the Holy Spirit, um, for God's renewing of us and our world. This is what we wait for during Advent. Let's go ahead and join together with our um, Advent and Christmas devotional, which um, comes from um, uh, Let Us Light Candles by Donna (laughs) Frischnicht Jackson, who is an editor of Presbyterians Today. And I realized yesterday I actually had read the the devotional for Sunday, so I'm going to go ahead and do Mondays and Tuesdays today. So day two is Monday, November 30th, our inner authority. One day, as he was teaching the people in the temple and telling the good news, the chief priests and the scribes came with the elders and said to him, Tell us, by what authority are you doing these things? Who is it who gave you this authority? He answered them, I will also ask you a question, and you tell me. Did the baptism of John come from heaven, or was it of human origin? They discussed it with one another, saying, If we say from heaven, he will say, Why did you not believe him? But if we say of human origin, all the people will stone us, for they are convinced that John was a prophet. So they answered that they did not know where it came from. Then Jesus said to them, Neither will I tell you by what authority I am doing these things. Luke 20, 20, verses 1 through 8. For thus says the Lord God, the Holy One of Israel, in returning and rest, you shall be saved, in quietness and in trust shall be your strength. Isaiah 30, 15. I began lighting lighting candles year-round, not just during Advent and Christmas. When I moved into my 18th century home, it didn't seem appropriate to me to fill the primitive rooms, complete with small windows and low ceilings, with LED lights. 
While trying to stay true to the house's history, there was another reason I began living more by candlelight. I noticed a calming peace watch over me whenever I lit a candle, especially when I was faced with a pressing writing deadline or grappling with a church conflict. The candle gave me permission to be still and invited me to stop filling my world with words for answers or rebuttals and to listen to God's whispers. Those who have studied Howard Thurman's writings describe him as having a quiet faith as they have noticed that throughout his life he sought a deep commitment to silence. It was in this silence that Thurman discovered that he, what he called the inner authority, that place in our hearts where we find the strength and purpose to live the lives we are called to live and, by doing so, possibly to be able to make a difference in the world. The priests and scribes were always asking Jesus who gave him the authority to turn the world upside down and to challenge the status quo. We know Jesus' authority came from above, but what we tend to forget is that Jesus spent quiet time alone with God to renew his strength and to gain clarity. These days, we are so quick to react with rebuttals and rhetoric. What would happen if we quieted down long enough to tap into that inner authority? Thurman speaks of. How could God speak to us? What would be what would we be led to do? The prophet Isaiah reminds us that in quietness and in trust shall be your strength. This Advent, may we find our strength, may we find our inner authority. Let's pray. God of great guidance. Quiet my heart today so that I can be fully present to you and tap into an inner authority, which will renew my strength to better serve and glorify you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. In order to go deeper, turn off your email notifications, cell phones, and TVs, and give yourself at least 30 minutes of uninterrupted quiet time to reflect on Thurman's idea of the power of inner authority. This is a wonderful challenge for us in our modern world um, to just take a moment of silence, to take 30 minutes, and just reflect. I was also... um, mindful as I was reading uh, that that presence of a candle and that flame. Um, I was just reading about, I believe it's the Seminole tribe in, um, in Florida, sees a sacredness of fire, that that's through fire we can commune with those who have come before, which is just an interesting, there's something about fire and flame that really speaks to us as human beings. Let's look at day three as well. Tuesday, December 1st, seek a, Seeking a Gracious Spirit. How the faithful city has become a whore. She that was full of justice, righteousness, lodged in her, but now murderers. Your silver has become dross, your wine is mixed with water, your princes are rebels and companions of thieves. Everyone loves a bribe and runs after gifts. They do not defend the orphan. The widow's cause does not come before them. Isaiah 1, 21 through 23. Who can separate us from the love of Christ? Will hardship or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? Romans eight thirty five. I used to skim over scripture passages that didn't seem holly jolly to me during this supposedly holly jolly season. After all, who wants to hear about once faithful people losing their way to the point where God's wrath is invoked? I didn't ignore these passages. I don't ignore these passages anymore. Maybe it's a sign that I'm getting the wisdom that I heard comes with age. While I can't be certain of possessing such wisdom, I'm certainly... I'm certain that Advent is not a time to skim over the evil and injustices of this world. If anything, Advent is a time to face the darkness, holding on to God's promised light as we confront the injustices. We must remember to have a gracious spirit. 
Howard Thurman spoke of this gracious spirit as one that doesn't gloss over the stark, brutal nature of evil. Rather, he said a gracious spirit was what helped him see clearly and stay mindful that even as I resist evil, I share the guilt of evil. In his book, The Mood of Christmas, Thurman wrote, I am aware that the light not only illumines, but it also burns. Chris Singleton, a former professional baseball player, has a gracious spirit. His mother, Sharonda Coleman Singleton, was one of the Emanuel Nine, the men and women who were killed in the June 2015 shooting at Emanuel African Methodist Episcopal Church in Charleston, South Carolina. Amid the carnage, the world not only learned about each of these people, including Chris's mom, who was said to have a deep faith and a smile that lit up a room, the world also learned that what forgiveness looks like as family members spoke words that elevated love over hate. Sadly, this would not be the last act of violence against people of color in the United States. Seeking a way to honor his mother and to keep a conversation going and how, how important it is to set aside differences, Chris, on the fifth anniversary of the shooting, released a children's book, Different. The book, he told the local newspaper, shares the message of the importance of love and unity and how we need to celebrate each person's uniqueness. Like Howard Thurman, Chris Singleton isn't ignoring the evil in the world, but is seeking a gracious spirit in dealing with the injustices of the world. May we join in seeking that spirit as well. Let's pray. Loving God, we thank you for the gift of Jesus, your Son, who modeled for us the power of forgiveness as he died on the cross. Help us remember we are all standing in the need of grace and that the greatest gift we can give this season is to find ways to elevate love over hate. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And our challenge to go deeper is today, let us do two things that are very difficult to do. First, let us confess how we might be adding to the injustices of this world. Second, let us commit to moving forward in ways that elevate God's love for all. Uh, this is uh, goes very well along with um, reading from Joel, right? This is this call to confession, this call to really acknowledge who we are, um, the ways that we have messed up, the ways that we do not live up to God's high standard for us. It's part of the work that we have here for this season of Advent. And so I encourage us all to do so. Let's go ahead and join together now in prayer. Satisfy us with your love in the morning, and we will live this day in joy and praise. We praise you, God, our Creator, for your handiwork in shaping and sustaining your wondrous creation. Especially we thank you for the ministry of all the baptized. Those who provide for public safety and well-being. those with whom we work or share common concerns. Opportunities to share good news with others. The treasure stored in every human life. People of God, for what else do we give thanks? We give thanks that Bill has received good reports from doctors. That Aunt Anne's daughter has, is out of the hospital. We thank God that Julie, John, and Linda's daughter is feeling better and able to eat. We thank God that Tony, Lori, and Portia have all received negative tests for COVID.
We dare to pray for others, God our Savior, claiming your love in Jesus Christ for the whole world, committing ourselves to care for others in his name. Especially we pray for the church in Asia and the Middle East. Those who seek to save the earth from destruction. Those who work for the benefit of others. Those who cannot work today. All who proclaim your saving love. People of God, for what else do we pray? We pray for David II and Sophia, who are both recovering from COVID-19. We lift up Debbie and her hand. We also left, lift up Debbie's friend, Pat, um, who's waiting on tests for pancreatic cancer. We pray for Teddy, a, f- a friend of Bill's who is undergoing cardiac bypass surgery in December, as well as James, who's having bypass surgery. O Christ, splendor of the glory of God and perfect image of the eternal one who begot you, we praise you for the infinite love which sent you among us and confess you as the light and life of the world. And we adore you as our Lord and our God, now and forever. Amen. Now let us continue to pray using the words that Christ taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now may the God of hope fill us with all joy and peace. Through the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Bless the Lord. The Lord's name be praised. Thank you so much for joining me today for Daily Prayer. Join me tomorrow for some more. Like this video, share it with someone else, click on the subscription and the notification button, and go to our website, johncalvinchurch.org, for more information. Our liturgy today came from the Book of Common Worship of the Presbyterian Church USA 2018 edition, and our readings came from the New Revised Standard Version of the Bible. Our uh, devotion came from Let Us Light Candles by Donna Frisnick Jackson um, and Presbyterians today. Thank you so much for joining me. Have a very blessed day, and we'll see you next time. Bye.